Will you turn with me to Galatians, please, in chapter 6. Chapter 6, and I want to read verses 14 through the end of the chapter, please. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace on them, mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. I have shared with you that one time while in Africa I visited a slave market. It wasn't in use now, but they kept it as a museum. And I don't know what they were trying to tell me, but I was over there preaching, and so some of these black boys took me there and wanted, wanted me to see this. Well, I was glad. I didn't talk a whole lot about it to them, but I was glad that America was not the only ones, the only country that bought slaves. Many of them went to South America. Many went into other countries of Europe and around, but uh, there was a brand put on these slaves, especially as they came to America. I don't know about other countries. The brand of the owner, just like in the, in the old west in the days when they would brand cattle. And you could tell as they were out in the open range whose cows they were. Well, do you know that we are to have a brand, and that's the brand of Christ? Now, I know we have a brand in a sense. Many of you are wearing a wedding ring, and that's kind of a brand. But uh, we have a brand. Every one of us as Christians, we should have a brand, and that's the brand of a slave of Jesus Christ. I reread verse 17 once again. For henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, the brands of the one who owns me, the one whose slave I am, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Now Paul said, these are loyalty marks. These are love brands that I bear for the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells of another brand in the same section, circumcision, and that was a special connection that the Jewish people had, a ceremony, kind of a seal of their covenant uh, with God. But Paul says, I've got that, but I've got a higher brand, the marks of Christ. And that's what each one of us have, or at least should have. Now, do we bear the marks of Christ? Do we bear the brand of the Lord Jesus in our life? Let's see. I come back to the fifth chapter for just a moment, and it begins with a light. It's a brand of light, you see. And I begin reading in verse 22, and here's what God is trying to do in each one of our lives. He's trying to make something beautiful of us. Maybe we were sharp privilege. Maybe we still are. God's trying to make a warm fuzzy of us. God wants us to be like Him. God wants us to be like His Son. And in fact, it, it says the fruit of the Spirit, but what it is actually is Christ reproduced in our lives because this is who Jesus Christ is. Listen as I read. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And again, I say, this is what Jesus is trying to do in our lives. He's trying to make us, you know, into a beautiful person. And as long as we are Christians, he's working on us. Now, these are not just separate things that God does in our lives, but it's a whole package, you see, <coughs> that the Holy Spirit brings and reproduces in us. Now, because of our own personalities and dispositions, maybe some of these things come out stronger and some weaker in our lives. But, you know, it's a package deal. And he's trying to make something beautiful. It's <coughs> supposed to be different from the people of the world. Many of the people of the world are coarse. Many of the people of the world are, are you know, bad news. We're not supposed to be. As a Christian, being a Christian should bring us to that point where we begin working with the Holy Spirit in our lives that the mark of Christ is there. Well, it begins in the sixth chapter early on in verses 1 through 6, uh, how this life is manifest. For example, in verse 1, 
Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Christians are not only supposed to be good, but we're supposed to be good for something. There are people that we can, can just, you know, walk up beside in life and put our arms around them and help them. Sometimes it's in a material way, this is true. Sometimes it's in counseling, sometimes it's just in sympathy. Are you being used that way? This is what God wants. And this is the life that we just read about up in the fifth chapter that's now put into action. Bear one another's burdens. And that fulfills the law of Christ. Come back with me a little bit earlier in that fifth chapter in verse 13. And we pick this up also to help explain things. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only he is not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. All right, are we beginning to get the idea? God is saying this, and God is working in our lives, and God wants to meet our needs, but then he wants to use us, and he flows through us to meet the needs of other people. And again, I say it can be a material thing, I get a lot of calls because the same rain comes in, uh, that comes into the church comes over to the house. And uh, so I get calls, you know, for gas, for money for eating, or for food. I get many calls. And you can't meet all of them. And you get many letters through the mail. Give me letters, you know, from different organizations. You can only give so much and to so many. And the rest you just have to say, no, I'm sorry. I've got a good line because I'm an old man, you know. And I have to, I have to watch it. And, uh, oh, you're that old? Yes, you do need to help. We'll send you some help. But, uh, but folks, we are to be helping <coughs> other people as we possibly can. But then it goes on in verse 3. We're to be humble. We don't, we don't say, hey, look at all the people I helped. Don't let, your, don't let your left hand do what your right hand is doing. In other words, do it as unto God. Not for applause, not for men's praise, but whatever we do, we do for Jesus' sake. And then he says something strange in verse 5. He says, carry your own load, in other words. Every man shall bear his own burden. Nobody owes us anything, folks. Do you realize that? I mean... We ought to pull our own weight. And then when we get on an uphill pull with too big a load, somebody else comes beside us and helps us. And that's where Christian brotherhood and sisterhood comes into play. And then the concern in verses 7 through 10, and just quickly, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall they also reap. If we have a heart, for God and a heart for other people, it'll come back to us. That's what it says in this verse. Whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. And you can mark it down. You can, oh, some people will take advantage, of course. But the, the nice person is the one that people appreciate and they'll do anything they can to help you in any way that they, they possibly can. But in verse 8, it just says, hang in there. Or verse 9, rather, just hang in there. Let us not be weary in, in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. God, God says, I'll take care of you. And it'll all come back to you. Whatever you give, I'll give back to you. And we can count on that. Whether it be the tithes into the church and missions, or whatever it be, we can count on that. We can bank on that. Because God will keep his word. And whatever we do to others will also be done to us. Because God will see that when we are in the place of need. God will see to that. And it's saying in verse 10, and kind of giving us a plan of action. It says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. But especially, you get that? But especially, unto them who are the household of faith. If there is a brother and sister that has a need, or their heart is breaking, or they're struggling with a problem, that's where you and I are to come in. And Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, we read this, as God has comforted us, 
we are to comfort other people. And we're to be active in the things of God in this way. But in verse 14, coming down quickly now to the chapter to where we begin our reading. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am in the world. God forbid. I don't want to be self-centered. I don't want to just live for John. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live for others. You remember this, the point that was put into a song, and I promise I won't, I won't uh, sing it, but Lord, let me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer would be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I might live like you. The cross is the bottom line, folks, of your life and mine. And it ought always to be. It's not the world. It's not the stuff that's in the world. It's not just taking care of my wife, me, and my kids, and that's it. But it's seeing the bigger picture of being a missionary in this world, a representative and ambassador for Jesus Christ. You may never get to go to Africa. One of the men from the other church, he doesn't attend much, but his wife does. He's a preacher and uh, he's Southern Baptist and nobody else can do it like Southern Baptist, so he doesn't attend. But he went to Africa for about two weeks and his wife said that he's home now and he had a, a tremendous time. You may not be able to go to Africa, but there are people right in this church family that need your help. Don't you have something to share? Have you gone through something that somebody else is going through right now? And can you come alongside them and help in some way? That's what this verse is talking about. The cross is the bottom line. The old rugged cross is my cross and is yours. We died on that cross, according to Romans chapter 6. We've been crucified with Christ. This same book in chapter 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can we pick it up? Can we, can we grasp this? I take my stand for God. I will not be moved. This is one of the marks that maybe you are called upon to bear. Some people may take advantage of you, and that may be a mark on the heart or on the mind. But it's a brand of Christ. Lord, I'll do it for Jesus. I'll do it all for Jesus. The cross changed Paul's life, and it ought to change our lives. One day that little Jew that hated Christians and hated the name of Jesus Christ went out with papers in his hand to, to bring any Christians into Jerusalem to try them, some of them to jail them, others to kill them. But God struck him down on the road to Damascus. And he realized that it was Jesus, that great light that shone upon him. And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that ought to be the experience of every one of us. Paul was changed. And that one who hated the Jews went everywhere. Or that one who hated the Christians went everywhere. Making Christians. Pleading with people to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But it changed him from a heart of stone and a heart of hate to a heart of love. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel now. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he said, I love my God, I love Jesus, and I love people. And they need the Lord. I want them to find what I have done. His life was changed. Too many times we accept Jesus and that's as far as it goes. We never grow. We never become a disciple. We never become a follower of the Lord Jesus. One man back at the home church didn't really want to join because he said, the minute I do, and I wasn't the pastor there, my brother-in-law was, he said, the minute I do, and old Charlie knew how to put the hand on you to get you to do something, he said, Charlie, I put me on a board, and that's exactly what happened, but he wasn't too unhappy about it. 
because he found that serving Jesus wasn't that bad and that hard, hard even in a Baptist church. But Paul said, I'm challenged. I'm challenged, and I find it in verse 17. For henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There were a lot of people, Jewish Christian people, who were challenging Paul. Paul, you have left the faith. You've got to keep the law. You, the, the, the boy babies have to be circumcised. Paul said, don't bother me with all this stuff. I've got to care of all the churches on me. I've, I've got other people to reach other towns, to reach other countries to reach. He said, don't bother me with these trivial things. I stand by the cross. But Paul did carry the burden of many churches, as you read the epistles. And he said, the rest of you, chill out on these non-essential things. Just give me latitude, pray for me, that I might go and do what every one of us ought to be doing. But he said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And I turn back to the book of 2 Corinthians and the 11th chapter. And we get just a picture of Paul's life. It wasn't like a modern day preacher in America. Not at all. It would be like Paul preaching in some of the countries of the Middle East right now. But he said in verse 24 of chapter 11, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. What is he talking about? He was arrested. His back was bare. And they took the whip to him. Thirty-nine times. I mean, five different occasions. But thirty-nine times the whip came down upon him. Not forty. Because the Jewish people thought that that was really humiliating a person to do that much. But five different times his back must have looked like railroad tracks all the way across it, up and down. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. One time. They hated him so much in his message, so much that they grabbed him and took him outside of town and threw stones at him. Rocks. And he was left for dead. But God needed him again. And so God raised him up and he went on his way. But can you imagine what this man looked like? He had been beaten so many times. He must have been a sight. But this little Jew loved the Lord. This little Jew, though he probably had bad eyesight from that encounter on the Damascus Road, and he says on several occasions in his epistle, you see what large letters I signed my name there. All dictated his letters, the epistles. And someone else wrote them. But he would sign them so that they would know that it was authentic and from the Apostle Paul. But here was this little man, he said, I don't care what they do with me. I'll get up and I'll go on for Jesus. But I go on reading here because it says in verse 26, in journey off. Now he didn't have a car, he didn't have a motorcycle. But he traveled all over Asia Minor and all over parts of Europe, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own country, in perils of heathen, in perils in the, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. And he said back up in, uh, back in 25, he said, I suffered shipwreck, and night and day I was in the water, in the Mediterranean Sea. But in verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings off, in hunger and thirst, in fastings off, in cold, in nakedness, beside those things that are uh, without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. And here, sometimes you get word back that, that something happened in the church that was awry and not, not glorifying to God, and it would break his heart. And he'd write to the church. Go there if he could, or send Timothy, or someone else. But he bore all this, and he kept pushing on, no matter how tired he was. I had kind of a busy week, and I got up this morning. Mary finally came back in there and said, It is ten after seven. Well, I looked at my clock right next to the bed, and I said, No, it's six minutes after seven. I wanted her to call and, and uh, you know, report in that we were sick, and we wouldn't be here, and we could go fishing. But I didn't. I got up and got my clothes on and finally got my eyes open and, and uh, went on. But 
Paul did this day after day after day. And he did it. I'll do it all for Jesus. I'll do it all for Jesus. And this is the attitude that we ought to have. We are not called upon to break our bodies like this in all probability. To, to go to that point where we just expend ourselves. But we are called upon to be God's representatives. We are called upon to be a base of operation through which God can work in our communities, in our families. Oh, it bothers me so terribly. I see some of my relatives, my sisters and brothers, and uh, what, they, what they have neglected in their family. My sister wrote a note, and I think I've shared it with you, wrote a note uh, on a tract that I had given her on the back of it. Pouring out her heart for her kids, hoping that they would come to the light and, and be saved. But she never took them to Sunday school and church. And I see other families in, in my family, the larger families, that way. What's happened to our kids? If only we had gotten up with them. If we had seen that they were in Sunday school and church, in the junior church. You know that, well, I talked to a lady this last week, and I said, when did you give your heart to the Lord? She said, when I was six years old in a little Baptist church over near the key. Get a six-year-old, be saved, yes, again. I was in meetings down in, in uh, a little town in, where was it? That time? I think I was in Arizona. And a little boy came up, four years old, and he wanted to be baptized. He came forward, presented himself for baptism. The preacher talked to me afterwards. He said, what am I going to do? He said, he, he came forward, he gave his heart to the Lord. Four years old. Now he wants to be baptized. I said, baptize him. It is possible. But most people are saved early in life. Because we, we build up otherwise in our hearts and our minds. Almost a hardness, a callousness. And we're too busy. We're too involved with other things. Well, Paul said, I bear in my body these marks. And they're love marks. Because I love Jesus. And I want other people to know him. And love him. So I'll give my all. I've been tortured many times. But I just put it in God's hands. And I can, I can take it. Because he's with me. Every blow that Paul took was meant for Jesus. He is watching the world today. I know that that you get uh, the booklet and, and so on, the magazine, Torture for Your Faith. You get that also. And you know in many of the countries of the world today, people are being tortured for their faith. They're being killed for their faith. But they keep running all down through. They want a Bible, no matter what the cost might be. And some people... Christians, just like us, will take a pack of Bibles and go into an area, go into the hornet's nest, and know that if we get caught, we'll probably lose our life. Would we do that here in America? Would we do that? Would we have enough guts to do that for Jesus? And Paul says, that's what I can do. But today, maybe our persecution is in another way. This is not... Christian America that we live in anymore, folks, it may come as a surprise to you. This is post-Christian America. And we can be ridiculed, and we are sometimes. We can be looked down upon, and we are sometimes. Straight laced and all. At a funeral in Vicksburg yesterday afternoon. And we closed out, it was one of the life story funeral homes. They closed out with the pictures of his life the man who had passed. And he accepted the Lord over at Heartland about a year ago. Thank God for that. But the thing is, right at the end, they zoomed in, had the Bible open, and zoomed in on John 3.16. And I complimented the funeral director afterwards. He said, you won't believe it. But one of the pastors here in town made me take that off, the one that I gave to the family that, because it wasn't 
the King James Version. Now, I, I like the King James Version. That's what I cut my teeth on beginning about 70 years ago or so. And so I'm used to it, and I can understand it. I love the, I love the Book of Psalms of the King James. But Wednesday nights, we use the NIV. We use, uh, we use the Living Bible as well as the King James or any other. I'm not saying be nitty picky like that. I'm saying open your heart to your life to others for Jesus' sake. And if they break your heart, if they call you square, if they call you whatever else, doesn't really matter. With the love of Jesus in your heart, doesn't that make up for it? Doesn't that take care of it? Isn't that enough? To stand by the cross is the thing. I think when we get to heaven, scars are going to mean an awful lot more than medals. And we're going to be left over for scars. Scars of the heart, of the mind, and so forth. But when something like that happens, I don't mean in heaven, it's all going to be okay there. But in life, a scar, whatever it might be, say, Jesus, I want to walk with you. If we deserve the ridicule, take it in love and in patience. But if we don't, say, it's all right, Lord. I don't have any nail holes in my hands and my feet. You did so much more. There's, there's a verse of a song, partly, and I'm not going to sing this one, but I take hope across thy shadow for my abiding place. And that's where the ground is level for Christians. Make him your Lord and your Savior. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the much that you have done for us. How you died on Calvary's cross for the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sins. And shed your blood, Lord Jesus, that our sins can be washed away. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Help us, Father, to thank you for what you've done. Help us to take our stand by the cross. Whatever the price, to pay it, because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.